Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Thank you for being here today. My, so thank you for being here today. My name is Beatriz Junco Gonzalez, and I am the Corporate Communications and Social Responsibility Manager at McKenzie Bank. And on behalf of my colleagues here today, everyone in McKenzie, we are so proud to be the sponsors of the Leadership Lecture Series and of our partnership with the Center for Leadership uh, here at FIU, headed by Dr. Myra Lewis, the woman in pink. <laughs> um, the Leadership uh, Lectures were established in 2011, and to date, we have brought more than 26 distinguished and world-renowned speakers to FIU and our community, and today is absolutely no exception. Mercantil has been the sponsor of, of this series, like I said, for about six years, and every lecture has been unique. And oh, there's something with the mic. I don't know. And very special. Uh, but today, for us, today's lecture is especially meaningful because uh, we consider our speaker today, Mr. Jimohalo, a part of the Mercantil Bank family. We are so proud to work with him and everyone at Deloitte. Of genuine uh, love and has recognized the work uh, that you've done in our community, this community that we call home, your business leadership and success. And we thank you for everything that you do for all of us in our community every day. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to recognize some members of our community that are with us today. Members of the Hollow family, Sheila, Wayne, Jerome, and Austin, thank you for being here. The Business Club of the Divine Savior Academy with their advisor, Ginger Poulos. And Mr. Robert Barber Jr., a member of Center for Leadership Board of Advisors, President of MGM Consulting and MGM Capital, and former Global Operations Vice President for Procter & Gamble. Mr. Gonzalez has held various leadership positions in marketing, sales, operations, and innovations in the U.S. and Latin America, including General Manager for Operations and Innovation for P&G North America, Director for Market Strategy and Planning in various categories for North America, and Regional Director of Latin America Global he received his undergraduate degree from Cornell University and a graduate degree from Harvard University. He has also served as a visiting scholar at Pembroke College, Oxford University, Inc. Mr. Gonzalez, if you can join us. Well, I'm really glad we got to do all today. Because we're in a small room and we just had it. Thank you very much. We appreciate you bringing turning out today. Thank you, Betty, for to you your support and back and back very much. Very much appreciated. Let me take a moment and uh, give another round of applause to Mr. Kilbatch for the sponsorship of the lecture. And thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Today, the Leadership Lecture Series is very proud to present and welcome Mr. Hugo Hollow, who is Chairman and President of the Plan Based Authority he had a degree in architecture in Paris. He made his way to the city where he was a very visionary developer. He is regarded as the architect of modern land. In 1969, Kibor built the first high rise office building on Little Avenue and has since helped develop our urban core with innovative spaces to live, work, and play. Kibor described real estate as a dynamic profession, one that challenges our best minds to explore. How to use our limited resources to finance and create useful and exciting spaces. We 
the state being a limited resource in Miami, Florida is for looking, looking for an encore for most of these It's currently constructing, constructing a high rise that will stand, at least for now, and we hope for many, many years, as the tallest building in Florida, the Panamera Tower is 868 feet. A tremendous accomplishment. Congratulations to everyone in Florida. The company has plans to build other spaces in Miami that will reach up to 1,049 feet. The highest allowed by the Federal Aviation Administration. Pretty soon they will be shut down to SpaceX uh, for the area of all our city. But the company has covered a lot of ground as well. Founded 60 years ago, Florida East Coast Realty has been involved in the development of 16 million square feet of space, single family homes, residential and commercial real estate, government buildings, marinas, high end retail centers, warehouse complexes, and telecommunication centers from New York to Nevada and throughout Florida. Pure and White Shiva have been tremendous friends and supporters of FIU for many years. They helped establish the Pure and Shiva Hollow School of Real Estate at FIU College of Business. And earlier this year, Pure, a Holocaust survivor, served as a keynote speaker at the FIU Holocaust Day of November. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Timor Hollow. I uh, so would be like to be in front of such an enlightened audience. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> if you want to know about real estate today, uh, we have to go back about 70 years to the GIs, 10 million of them who. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Abroad, 10 million of them dreaming to come home to a little house, to a driveway, and maybe even a little car. In a grateful, grateful country, under the GI Bill of Rights, gave up their dream. A little house for $6,950, 40 year mortgage, nothing done. $17 a month payment for the next 40 years. But they had their dream. And the dream, that dream, created suburbia. But suburbia was next to the city. But it grew a half an hour, an hour away, two hours away to some people, coming back and forth in six lane traffic to their world. It was an acceptable lifestyle to that generation because they had their dream. The little house, the driveway, maybe a car. But what happens to suburbia? What does it do? Exactly. Uh, a section of land is about a mile by a mile contains 640 acres. Under the principles of cutting it up to home size, they supported roughly 1,600 families in that eight mile by mile uh, section of land. Uh, included in that were little neighborhood shopping centers, uh, the fire station, the police station, some municipal buildings, a couple of offices, and even a small park that kids could play with their dad in the weekends. Why in the weekends? Because the fathers had to leave at 6 in the morning to get to work. They came home late, exhausted. It was very not the time to see kids in those days. But the weekends, they could be fathers. Still, it was an acceptable, acceptable lifestyle to the GI generation. But then came the Yankees. <laughs> that wasn't acceptable. They didn't like it. And they didn't like the 
senseless decimation of land. You see, air regenerates in the atmosphere. Water spans in the springtime. But you cannot replace land. And we were urbanizing, better to say suburbanizing, America. They were building 1,200,000 homes annually. That meant that they had to use up over 80,000 acres of land. Now, what does it mean, 480,000? In Texas, you have 10,000 square foot ranches. So what is 480,000? Now, 480,000 acres represent approximately 1.2% of Florida. That uh, was 1.2%. But in 10 years, it's 12% of the state of Florida. That's what we were urbanizing annually. For senseless. And what it forced us to urbanize? Uh, a section of land a mile represents 5,280 feet. The developers cut it into 17 splits, meaning about 300 feet, 120 feet, uh, 125 foot lots on both sides, and a 50 foot street or a 60 foot street. 17. And then they had three pro streets also. That's fine. Can you imagine 20 miles of roadways, 40 miles of curb and gutter to get rid of the drainage, and 40 miles of sidewalks to walk on to support 1,600 families. And then you had to have infrastructure lines to carry away the sewage, and drain fields to drain the land. wasn't acceptable economically, but that's what happened, and that's why this generation, the lucky generation, was rebelling against you. Your fathers, they felt that they should come closer to the womb, to the point of the poor of the cities, and they were selecting an internet lifestyle, also very satisfactory. The high rise buildings. And that time the high rises were 14 stories, 10 stories. A couple of them each 20 stories. The improper punch, but they didn't shoot. They didn't have to travel two hours a day to work and two hours a day coming together. So there was a trend. Developed closer into the core of the cities. And the city started to grow in that core. And my re migration into the cities commenced from the suburbia. This generation didn't have much demands. They just wanted to be closer to their work, enjoy their families. Tradition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So they were happy to be with their families, and that trend started to move on. I was lecturing to a little neighboring university here in the late 60s. I think it's called the University of Miami. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I talked about re-immigration in the cities and they're going to develop, it was a strange idea at that time. But it happened. It was happening then and it was keep going on. So then came the millenniums, the millenniums, new generation. Brand new, fantastic, energetic, new generation, completely different from their fathers, certainly from their grandfathers. They wanted comfort, convenience, 
They wanted entertainment and excitement. So they looked for the city for all these things. And Miami was a very good target. Performing arts in opera, ballet, theater, 80 restaurants, sport venues, the ballpark, the arena. Most of all, they had transportation. Three points of transportation besides walking. Always very walkable. It's only 30 blocks, but they had three sets of transportation. They had the free trolley, the bus, and the rapid transport. So Miami was a sparse by then. We now have 20,000 families who moved in already in these last 15, 20 years into the core of Miami, downtown Rica Avenues. My gosh, 20,000 families and it's gone. But where do you put them? You have to put them in a, in a different dimension, vertical. And I call it vertical intensification. Because as, as, as the fronts are growing and the people moving in, you need taller buildings to house them. So Miami started to grow in height. At first, 30 stories, 32 stories. Then I built a building for the grant that was 42 stories. And it provided a very satisfactory house. We couldn't even bless the people out of, out of the building today. They, wanna, they love it, they want to stay there. So, it has given a day of life to this generation. But the buildings have to get higher and higher. And they will get even higher today because you have to accommodate them. And underlying this physiological, or psychological fact of that generation, they want to know about it. They don't want to have baggages. Why? I have a job as an IT person at the accounting firm in Brick Aladdin, or I get $120,000. You have back here just offered me $200,000. I'm moving. I don't want anything left behind. I don't want baggage. I'm going. Mobility was important. So what happens? Ownership is diminishing. Obviously, the condominiums have, have to beg a little bit. Rentals increasing because it's very easy if I got a job at Hewlett Packard. Okay, I have my least three more months, I'll pay it off the bike. And that is the attitude, and it's a right attitude. So that's what happened. I oh my. It came a long way. So, what do they like? And you have to, if you have a developer, you have to think of it. You can't think that you build it their town. What you build, you have to understand your clientele, and you have to understand what you want. We're building a building now for Panorama Tower, it's 868 feet, as you're we told, 85 story high. Vertical intensification, but what you put into building? We have two acres of recreation, pools, cruises. We have 50,000 square feet of amenities, a 50,000 square foot gym, with, with spinning room, with yoga room, with pilates room, with exercise rooms, and about 100 machines. We have a, we have a children's playground, playroom. We have billiard room. Don't that happen? We have a musical. Do you know what the musical is? How many of you play some instrument? Yeah. <laughs> you want to play your instrument? You can do that in an apartment. It's too hard. So we created a song for room where you can get together for a jam session or record. <laughs> <laughs> you have 1500 
souls remain in the building. Some of them will want to do this. You have you have a dining room. Beautifully offered a dining room for 24 people. Because supposedly you want to entertain more than two couples so you can entertain in your apartment. You have nowhere to go. They can engage it, all they have to do is clean it after. Do the wine tasting. It's pretty good to that. And then we have something that up till now wasn't considered. And I got that idea as I was coming down in Opera Tower, uh, and next to me was a young lady with a with a dog, with a pet. And I was making conversation, who do you like better, your boyfriend or your pet? <laughs> <laughs> she started laughing, no countess, no countess. <laughs> Uh, so, so you have to provide for your pets because people love their pets. So we put a kennel in, in the building where you can eat your pet for a day, for a weekend, for a week, get in room, etc. My oh my, it came a long way from the dream of G.I. Joe. <laughs> The little house, the driveway, and maybe a car. Thank you. <laughs> Don't embarrass me, please. <laughs> so, any questions? I'm delighted to answer, even if I don't know the answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your There's a question. There's a question. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I don't think we could uh, cause you to embarrass yourself if we tried. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. It was very illuminating. You talked a little bit about how important transportation was to the urban core and the environment that you're developing. And I think there's a feeling that in Miami it hasn't kept up with the, the growth. So any thoughts you might have on what comes next for, for transportation? Appreciate that. Thank you for asking the question. It's, uh, I can relate to a very interesting uh, meeting I had with, uh, not meeting, but uh, running through a couple, uh, young couple, to me very young, 30, 30 33. Yeah. Uh, both of them accountants. One is working for the big four, and the uh, other one, is, the lady was working for a, a company in uh, on Rickard Avenue. And uh, they they lease a, a nice apartment. And uh, I asked them. I happen to be at the leasing center, and I was asking them, uh, "What kind of cars do you have?" Well, he looked at me and he said, "They have no cars." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, well, three years ago, we post account of the cars. I had a Ford Victoria, my wife had a small Mercedes. What do you think Mr. Holloway post a year? So, I dubbed, he said, $40,000. He said, $65,000. Oh, he said, you say, let them go. Parking, gasoline, insurance, depreciation. Cost of money, occasional repairs, you know, you know, <laughs> uh, 65,000 dollars. I said, but it must cost you money from transportation. He said, yes, last year we spent together 17,000 dollars on Uber and on taxi. He said, but we saved almost 50,000 dollars, we can almost pay your rent, Mr. <laughs> So then he said something very interesting. He said, you know, I have to travel a lot. I coordinate the digital offices in the state of Florida. I said, and Asbury also. He said, and so I, yes. He said, across the street, on Brickell Avenue, we're talking about 11 or on Brickell across the street. He says, there is a rapid transportation. I go over with my carry-on, I get on it. 
have changed, and in 17 minutes for two dollars, I'm in the main terminal of the airport. That's wonderful for me. Think of it. If you ask me for transportation, for two dollars, for Britain, <laughs> you are in the middle of the airport. No vessel, no parking, two bucks. Uh, so, I got to think, and I said, I have to, said to myself, I have to find out what's going on with cars. The city made me do two dozen car parking garage. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do with it? These guys have no cars. Who else doesn't have cars? So I investigated the new buildings downtown, like Metri, others. And I found out that 30% of the tenants, the residents, do not have cars. 30%. What do I do with my government? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that answers. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, can you give uh, young people like ourselves some advice what not to do? What not to do? What not to do? Uh, don't borrow too much money. <laughs> 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 oh, well, that's what you have in your That? Stand up. Oh, uh, yeah. Over here. Hi, yeah. Thank you for your uh, your information and congrats and all your accomplishment. Um, as a beginner in the real estate industry, what would be your top three advice? I think the first thing. In as a beginner in the real estate avenue, what would be your top three advice? Thank you. My what, 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 top, top three, top three advice. recommendation or advice you would give to a beginner. Uh, Okay, uh, I, I think that uh, my speech before related quite well to uh, to those things that are coming. Uh, I think that that I would concentrate on uh, on satisfying the the desires of the mainstream of today's. Clientele, feed them, uh, which is the millennium. That's your clientele. What is it? What they aspire for? What they want? And create your project if you please, uh, according to those wishes. Don't build and they will come. Let them tell you, find out what is it what they want. What is it what they are? For? What kind of lifestyle they interest and deal with that. Mr. Hollow, I'd like to ask you a question. You, your experience of, of, of success, you once said to me that uh, you're committed to hard work, and then you had a statement about the hard work, and what happens after the hard work. Would you talk a little bit about that, please? <laughs> Oh, it, it takes you to a better situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I got into business in 1949, and I had a, a very close friend who was my age, and we were used to work all together. But he happened to be the, one of the most famous uh, uh, column writer in the New York Post, which was at that time a big paper. And I was in business about a year. We are somewhere in the third year room having the drink. And he said, now that you are business a whole year, what do you think of business? I said, well, you have to work very hard to get there. He said, yes. And once you got there, you work harder. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I have a question. Hi, how are you? It's a pleasure to see you. That's a pleasure. Hi, how are you, Mr. Hollow? 
Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so I have a quick question. So I, I believe that our society, our world is a little, I guess I could say, obsessed with new. Um, con the constant desire to have something new, uh, something better. The grass is always greener. So eventually when Miami runs out of space, um, and now that Brickle is running out of space, how do you constantly satisfy the desire for new for those wanting to come and move to Miami? Thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's what I called earlier vertical intensification. We are building now buildings, 50, 60 stories. I have to have built, built I'm planning to build in hundreds, 85 stories, but that's not the end. FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, set the height in downtown Miami at 1,049 feet. 1,049 feet probably will represent about 95 levels of building. And uh, you will see those sprouting up. That's the only way that you will be only one thing that you can have to satisfy the demand that will come in the next 20 years. I believe that the next 20 years, that 20,000 people will double. We have doubled that many people on their part. Can I ask a question? It's great to know that you're building very, very tall buildings, going up to 60 and 70 stories. But at the same time, the sea is rising an inch every few years. Now, it's going to be great for the people in the top few stories. <laughs> so what happens to the guys downstairs? <laughs> that happens to be that each generation called the millennials Without the cash, you take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> Think of it, one more thing. We were decimating our land senselessly, senselessly taking our green belts and our forest away. You know, each forest swallows a lot of carbon dioxide, and the more forest you kill, that's what causes the environmental problems. But then you have the live forest, and they are not being destroyed by subdivision after subdivision. Uh, that will help not to have that each rise. That's yes, true. When you were, say, 20 years old, did you envision yourself being where you are today? Like, did you always know that this was your long-term goal? And if you did, how did you create the path to get to where you are now? Uh, thank you. Uh, not really. I was a hopeful architect. My problem was when I finished architecture, nobody wanted an architect. Why? I'm playing Bill Levitt. Who heard about Bill Levitt? Never. You did. <laughs> Bill Levitt uh, took advantage of GI Bill and built literally tens of thousands of homes. The Leviton of Long Island, the Leviton of Pittsburgh. The way he did it, he went to an architect and he got a production plan for the three or two bedroom house. Paid two hundred dollars. Then he asked the architect to make eight different front elevations. So only every eight house looked the same. So 400 dollars, we have 20,000 houses, a penny a pen. Who needs an architect? <laughs> so I had to recycle myself. And I recycled myself to a contractor. At first I went to work for a contractor, then myself became a general contractor. I did about three months for Excuse me. Oh. Oh. I've got a quick question. Sure. I've known you for a long time. And I used to say to myself, I've never seen a 70-year-old man work so hard. And then I'd say 10 years later, I've never seen an 80-year-old man work that hard. And now I'm saying I've never seen a man any age work that hard. What makes you, after 60 years in the business and 60 million square feet, get up every morning and have the motivation to go and get it done again? You see, you see, thank you. 
major cities, uh, you, you can enter the market really at any level. I, invent, I enter the market looking for somebody for 45 cents an hour. And then I raised myself to $35 a week. That was my start. So it doesn't matter what level you enter. And if you cannot do your own profession that you think, and you cannot do that, you recycle yourself. <coughs> and you do something else. You're not worried about it. Good afternoon. Um, I'm reading the literature that you're writing. Please don't write it because Talk a little louder, please. Okay. You arrived to the United States with $18 in your pocket. Uh, then you <coughs> built 60 million square feet. But I would like to know how you did it because I have $18 in who had $18, and also the first day when I arrived that morning, people were waiting on the port. Came by, no planes, came by the boat, I should. And they were looking for people to work. So this gentleman says to me, well, what are you, an architect? Oh, I need an architect. I thought it was the most wonderful lucky day, he needs an architect, the first day I arrived. So he takes me to Lower East Side, and it's a little curtain factory, and he says, this is what you want to do, that's why you package the curtains. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll pay you 45 cents an hour. 45 cents was a lot of money, because that evening at 5 o'clock, he says to me, where are you living? I said, probably here I don't speak. He said, no, we'll go find you separate place. And that was the Lower East Side. So on Hester and Street and Eldridge, I saw a sign in the building, building uh, Room to Rent, 3A, Mrs. Turner. So I walked up to Mrs. Turner, opened the door, yes. I said, I saw your sign that you wanted them to So now comes the petty check. What's your name? My name. You speak English? I said, almost. <laughs> she said, uh, are you working? I said, yes. Where? She said, good question. <laughs> oh, I know the place. The room is two dollars a week. And I give you the room with the balcony. Oh, that's wonderful. Two dollars. I made that much today or today. $15, remember. So she takes me into a tiny bedroom, lovely, furniture from 1820 or something. <laughs> but I look for a balcony. Well, you have to open the window and step out on the balcony, which happened to have been the fireplace. <laughs> I mean, the fire escape. The fire escape of the building. But it was very colorful. You look down, all the peddlers are selling their books. It was interesting. I, I actually lived there for eight weeks. It was, it was very colorful. 
and I saved money. And the eighteen dollars became thirty-six dollars, and the eighteen dollars became two hundred dollars. And I saved money, and I got to the point where I could tell my boss, Mr. Joey McGee, at Berry Point Contract Court, Mr. McGee, I like to go in my own business. <laughs> very much. I want to thank all of you for being here. I was Mark Rosenberg. I have the privilege of being the president of FIU. And it's moments like these when I am so grateful that I have the privilege to be able to know individuals like Mr. Hollow and to be able to listen to their story and draw conclusions that can help all of us every day. And so I've had the privilege of knowing Mr. Hollow and his entire family now for at least a couple of decades. And there's no doubt in my mind that Mr. Hollow personifies who we are at our FIU. Mr. Hollow has a vision. He, he's a visionary. And vision, as you have seen, is, is the art of seeing the invisible. And is there anyone who has been able to see the invisible more successfully uh, than Tibor Hollow? A couple of years ago, I sat with him in his office, and he said, I'm going to build this 86-story building on Brickle. And uh, it honestly took me by surprise that uh, I know there's not a building so big. I know that uh, an 86-story building is a huge enterprise. And uh, frankly, I didn't think it would happen. And then I went to, to uh, see another individual who's a builder. And uh, that individual asked me where it was. I said, I just was with Mr. Hollow, and he's going to build this building. And that individual said to me, I'll never get the financing. Ladies and gentlemen, that building is almost completed now. And he is, he is now... Uh, making it available to our community. And uh, there never has been a day, uh, I know, since he started that building, when he had doubts that it would happen because he knew he could make it happen. He believed in himself. He could see the invisible. So the, the issue of vision is who we are. The, the second is that who we are is that we're solutions-oriented. Listen, you know that there were countless problems, countless challenges in getting that building built and getting the other uh, uh, thousands and millions of square feet built that he had built previously to that. But guess what? He figured it out. He had good people around him. He listened well. He was optimistic. And he got it done. So the, being solutions-oriented, rather than cursing the darkness, Let's find a way to get things done. And Mr. Hollow personifies that. And finally, who are we? We are results oriented. We like the impact at this university. We want to get things done. And so often here, we talk about who we are as individuals who will turn the impossible into the inevitable. In fact, you're sitting in a facility that would not have been possible without the persistence and the hopes and dreams of a lot of people. You see, we were turned down three times over a period of decade uh, by Tallahassee to build a law school, to have a law school for our community. And yet, we found a way to turn the impossible into the inevitable. And here we sit today listening to another dreamer who has been uh, extraordinarily uh, successful. So particularly for those of you uh, who are students uh, and who are wondering about what's going to happen, is there anybody you know who has had more challenges, more, more obstacles in his young life 
than Mr. Hollows. I don't think so. And yet look at what he has accomplished. So he sets a high bar for all of us. And with, if you ever doubt yourself, or if you ever doubt others, remember Tibor Hollow and everything that he has accomplished and everything that he stands for. And the most important part about Mr. Hollow and his family is not the buildings, ultimately, or not the success per se, but the most important thing is that you are looking at and, and hearing from and spending time with one of the most decent people that we have uh, in this world, Mr. Tibor Hollow. So please join me in thanking him and showing appreciation for all that he's accomplished because he sets a high bar for you, for me, and for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Obviously, Mr. Hollow, I want to thank Banco Mercantile for the support. I think Banco Mercantile is in the house. So thank you all. Can we please thank Banco Mercantile for the support? I want to comment the presence of a former member of our Board of Trustees, Mr. Robert Barlick. Bob, thank you for being here. Yeah. I want to thank Manny, Manny Gonzalez and the entire a Center for Leadership, Myra Beers, uh, for all that you do to help us raise the bar and keep the bar very high. There's a great reception out front, and when you get a chance, meet Jerry Cohen in the back, one of my advisors, who asked the first question. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. by Academic Video Services within the Division of Information Technology at Florida International University.